How many of you think you're normal? Okay, if you're not sure, consider the alternative. Yeah. Okay, I, we've got, you got the names of those who didn't raise their hand. Yeah, yeah, you got a photograph. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. Uh, that's not really the, the important question, but it's, it's important from the standpoint of getting us to think. What happens when we start to think that we're normal? I actually think it's a good thing that we think of ourselves as normal. But we can also then cross a very fine, probably unconscious line into thinking if I'm normal, maybe I am also therefore the, what's the root of normal? Norm. Are they different, normal and norm? In what way? If I'm the norm, then I've become the plumb line by which I can judge you. I'm, I'm the judge of whether your behavior, your speech patterns, your beliefs are good or bad. And I judge them by whether you agree with me and look like me and speak like me and use my language and have my beliefs. It actually becomes quite dangerous then when we move from thinking that we're normal to then thinking that, and probably unconsciously thinking, that we're also the norm. So that's going to be something that we're going to be aware of today. But what we're going to do is find out that there's probably five kinds of normality beyond ourselves, and we're one of them. But we're also mixtures of those normalities. And what we're going to be discovering is in what ways uh, do we tend to communicate and with what kinds of values do we communicate? How do other people differ, differ from us? How does that affect our leadership? How does it affect the other important relationships in our lives, like parenting, like being a spouse, a child that is having parents, and in our work environment, and of course, primarily, for today at least, leadership. Pierre uh, Case, or Casse, uh, determined that there were four basic communication styles. I actually felt that there were five, and you'll see the fifth one, uh, but there's four here, and then we'll develop the fifth one. And as it turns out, the fifth one is really one of the more popular communication styles. And the reason that that one is so critical and so important is because that's who I am. Okay, so you'll understand me in a few minutes. All right, so the first style, as you see, is the, the action person. And the action person is concerned about getting things done, achieving and doing. In the broad scope of things, that's kind of who they are. That's how they define themselves. Those are the values that they bring to virtually any kind of situation. It's how they manage their lives. The second style, and that's uh, style two on your worksheet, is process. This person tends to ask a different question. Not what needs to get done, but how ought things to get done? Uh, what's the process by which we go from A to B and you know, eventually to the goal? So their concern has to do more with strategies, with how to organize for the task, the kinds of information, the facts that we need in order for us to move forward in a very responsible way and to get to the end in a quality kind of fashion. The third style is the people person, and uh, the people person asks yet a different question, and that's the question, who? Um, who will I be working with? Who will be affected by this? Who's involved? And so their tendency is to focus on communication. Uh, that can sometimes just be reduced to talking, that is, it's important to talk these things through. A lot of emphasis on relationship, building, sustaining, repairing relationships, and then working together. Teamwork is really important. Getting along and getting things done and enjoying it as we do it. Uh, it's all about people, isn't it, would be their, their comment. The fourth style, and that's number four then, is the idea person. The idea person says, yes, what is important? Getting things done, that's important. Of course it is. 
and how it's done, of course, that's necessary. I, I, anybody knows that. And who is to be involved, that, of course, is important as well. But the really important thing is, why do you want to be doing this in the first place? Why is this more important than anything else? Where is this in the priority, in the big picture of life? How does this fit in? How do you know you're not doing something trivial rather than something important? So the why question. And in the why question, then, the idea person tends to focus on the abstract or the conceptual. That's a good part of the world. Sometimes we would say the cognitive, but not necessarily. Cognitive person can also be any of these others. The idea person tends to focus on theories. That is, what have other people done? What, what does the research say? What are the findings? Uh, what evidence do we have? And they also then tend to focus on innovation, or a, another word would be for change. They love the new and the different and the novel, moving ahead, exploring new frontiers. Okay? So that's a basic summary. We're going to move more deeply as we move along. But are there, oh, we got one last one I said, and this is on your sheet as well. The blend person. Uh, not to be confused with bland, okay? That's not what we're talking about here, the blend. The blend person, if they're a four-part blend, they draw somewhat equally from all four of the styles. Uh, you might say they're an amalgam, or a mixture, or a blend. Now, some people might be three-part blend. And if they're three-part blend, the circle would probably go out a little bit farther on those three parts. It's interesting with, with uh, my, I, I taught at Wheaton College in an undergrad program for a number of years. My, all my college students wanted to know, so if you're high action, who should you be marrying? You know, who should, <laughs> what, what would your spouse look like? What would be the perfect score? So you could kind of see them handing out these inventories before chapel or something <laughs> like that, you know, and announcing the winner at the end of chapel. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the reality is that uh, that's probably not the best way to approach the, the situation because uh, virtually every combination uh, exists. So if that's not the best question, what would the best question look like? The best question probably looks like, uh, what does a mature action person look like? And how do they find out the maturity level of the person they're marrying? Because that, that's really a pretty important kind of thing. Uh, another question might be, how, how, much, how flexible are you in terms of differences? I argue that marriage is the greatest cross-cultural experience you're ever going to have. <laughs> and it's a lifetime experience. So how flexible are you, et cetera? It takes you twice as long to restore emotional energy units expended as it does physical energy units expended. That's why some of you who preach or are pastors, that's a very powerful emotional kind of process that you go through on Sundays because you're preaching the Word of God. That's a heavy responsibility. And you're responsible for the care of the flock. Heavy responsibility. At least when I pastored, the end of Sunday, I was, I was beat. And that's why many take Mondays off, because it's a restoration time. And now we begin to understand what happens when emotional energy is expended. Now, the preaching part of Sunday was great. It was uh, spending all that time with people that burned my energy. Okay, see? Four, all right? But what are you going to do? That's part of the job, and you have to do it. And actually, over time, I began to realize that my wife had so much to teach me. And so I began to learn from her how to connect with people. Uh, but, and my oldest son is just like me. And he, had, he went through a process by which he had only one friend. His brother had lots of friends. And he wanted to be more like his mom and more like his brother. And so he and I together watched my younger son and my wife, his mom, mom and brother, and we began to see what they did, and we modeled them. So for example, my wife smiles every time she sees somebody. Well, 
Isn't that a nuisance to have to smile every time? You should have a reason for smiling. I mean, not just because, not just because you're alive, but some other reason, some better reason. But they did it, all right? And so I, I forced myself. And, and I, you know what? I felt so hypocritical because I wasn't smiling inside. I was, you get this little plastic thing here, you know. But you know what? Even if it feels hypocritical, if it's the right thing to do, you do it. Because I had an unfortunate and probably negative habit that I was now practicing and it felt artificial and plastic, but pretty soon it felt more natural. And it felt more natural as people gave me positive feedback. All of a sudden the relationship seemed to be more smoothly, more smoother. And, and it was more enjoyable being with people. And pretty soon I didn't feel the fatigue factor nearly so much. Uh, so when my wife, who scored a people, a very high people score, like 18 or 19, um, when she did her PhD program, you can't be a people person and complete a PhD program. I mean, you got to stop going to the parties and hit the books and write papers. <laughs> and that was agony. But she did it. And she actually became a blend person for that period of time. And then as soon as she got her PhD, it's boing, you know, right back to the party scene. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating here. Uh, but yeah, we adjust. We're flexible. But now you understand what's happening. Rather than just being frustrated, you say, okay, I'm functioning in the area of a low score, and I, you know, I understand that. But I've got to do it because there's a goal that I have that I think God has set before me, and I want to do it for the glory of God. Therefore, let's get rid of this frustration and realize that, that I'm, this is perseverance. This is dis self-discipline. This is what it takes sometimes in life, getting through it. Number seven. Uh, quite important, everyone is a composite of all the scores. Um, so why are we labeling you action, process, et cetera, if everybody's a composite? What those single words do is they create, they're sort of like windows into that person. After a while, you begin to realize that this is, a, this is an idea person or this is a people person. And now... What that does is it gives you the freedom to adjust your style, to speak their language, to speak into their frame of reference, and you change to serve them. Information is power, but power can be used to oppress or to serve. I used to train, I don't know, General Motors, it's like GM Opel in Europe, I think. I trained General Motors salespeople for a number of years. Then I found out they were using this information to manipulate their clients, and I stopped. That was a wrong way to use information. And I could do it too, and I did it sometimes. And I, when I realized what I was doing, I was ashamed. But what it does now is that you realize that I have second highest scores and third highest scores, uh, but if I know who you are, and I can usually figure that out quite quickly by, uh, by saying you're either process or your idea, then I can begin to adjust myself to who you are and serve you from your frame of reference rather than asking you to become like me. I, in fact, try to become more like you to serve you. And then under stress, number eight, people revert to their primary style. Uh, this is where we're going to close, but what happens when an action person gets under stress? What do they do to relieve their stress? How is that different from the process person and what they do under stress situations, or the people, or the idea, or the blend person? What in the world does that person do under stress? Because, you know, they're multi-directional all the time. The interesting thing here is that if I want to help you relieve your stress, I assume you're like me. And we do that with our spouses all the time and our children. And often by, by my imposing on you how I handle stress, it makes your stress worse. So in terms of serving people, sometimes we actually don't serve them at all. We make the situation worse because we don't know their frame of reference. We don't know where they're coming from. The action person, follow me as I move from top to bottom now, the action person tends to 
tends to focus on productivity, accomplishment, feedback, task, getting the task done, task oriented, on practical matters, on getting things done, doing. They focus on results, the here and now. They focus on being active or activity and goal oriented. Um, how does an action person express love? By doing things for other people. Yeah. And, and that's, that's their, their love language. I, I know that you know, you've probably read some books on that. But that's, that's the love language, the action person. My dad was an action person. He never expressed love in, verbally at all to anybody that I'm aware of. But he would do things. And it took me a long time to figure out that when dad did things for me, that was his way of saying I love you, or I care about you, or I value you, or I'm glad you're my son. But if we don't understand that, then we look at what they don't do, and we criticize what they don't do. And that affects the relationship. All right, the p process person. They tend to focus on gathering data and facts, analysis, planning, long and short range goals, very important. We've got to know where we're going, know where the target is. They, uh, uh, they like to establish methods and means by which those goals are achieved. Scheduling, of course. How long are we going to take? How much time is it? Reporting, evaluation, and then refining and fine tuning. What have we learned from all of this? What's, how does a process person express love? <laughs> well, they, they, they'll see limitations, and they're, they're simply pointing out what's good for you. <laughs> you say it one way, I'll try, to, I'll try to spin it just a little bit. But that's right. But they, in pointing out what will really help you, it comes across as criticism. But uh, that's an act of love on the part of the process person. But essentially, what they, what they do is they create a stable, safe life for you. Don't we have a, a retirement fund, you know, so we can retire and do things? Uh, don't we have a college fund for the children? You know, aren't we making our house payments? Those are the issues that the process person, it's, it's making life manageable. And for the process person, the best surprise is no surprise. Life is under control, all right? And when it's under control, that's how they express their care for their loved ones. People at group, they tend to focus on getting along, people's needs and feelings, dialogue, just talking together. That's such a wonderful thing. Loving and caring, peace, harmony, pleasing others, and, of course, cooperation. Uh, how do they express love? Hugging, yeah. They're, they generally are high-touch people. Uh, if you're a low-touch person, uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of creepy. <laughs> but yes, by touching, hugging, it's, it's what they do. And uh, what else? They're often verbal people. Not always, but often very verbal people. So they express their affirmation, their edification, their love and care. In a, and gifts, very much so, yeah, gifts is a form of, all right? The idea person, now this is a tough one because this is the lowest percentage wise, and I'll come back to the percentages in just a moment. The idea person tends to focus on reasons, that's the why issue, ideals. What would this world look like if we just got our act together? Concepts, for, they're forward looking or futuristic. They focus on knowledge. Now, their knowledge is a different knowledge. It's a knowledge of, of the big picture of things, whereas a process person, it's knowledge of the details. You know, the de the, the de if we don't tend to the details, but knowledge for the idea person is of very different nature. So they focus on the abstract, as we mentioned earlier on theory, principles, and their synthesizers. There's two ways of creating truth. One is analysis, and the other is synthesis. And this is the way in which the idea people create uh, truth. How does the idea person show love? Give your bright ideas to solve your life. By the affirmation of, by listening to them and affirming their ideas. Uh, 
that's how you that's how you express love to them. How do they show love to you? Generally, by sharing their mind with you. It's it's a very um, obscure kind of idea, but if the idea person allows you into their mind, that is their act of love. You you are a celebrated, uh, unique and very isolated individual who gets inside their head. And that's the idea person. They're also the hardest people to win to Christ. Now, the blend person. What do they focus on? <laughs> Variety, absolutely. Movement, that is back and forth. They don't like to stay one place very long. Uh, they have a wide expanse of interests. Diversity is, is something that they cherish. Diversity of experiences, diversity of environments. Uh, and relationships, for that matter. And so, in summary, all of the above, but not as intensive. Um, the blend person. And so, how do they express love? Well, just depends on how they feel at the moment. Uh, what's, you know, what's happening. I'll just give you a quick uh, breakdown here. Somewhere in the vicinity of about 16 to 18% of the population, and this population now numbers somewhere in the 20,000 range, but I only did, I've only done it with probably four or 5,000 people. So 18, roughly 16 to 18% here. When you get down to the people category, roughly 33 to 35% of the population. And much of that population has been uh, uh, missionaries. So that might, this might be slightly inflated, but I don't think so. Because I've also done it with faculties of schools, boards of trustees, et cetera. The idea group is about 10 percent, 10 or 11 percent, and they are the, 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 you know, the least understood. And the blend is roughly in the 28 to 30 percent range, just so you get some kind of a big picture here.